Yes. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God Almighty, it's such a joy to come into your presence each day, Father, to learn your word of our Father, for this privilege, for this blessing over our lives. We are so very thankful for the promises that we stand upon, where it says, Father, every morning your mercies are renewed of our Father. And we dwell in that mercy of our Father this day. We thank you for those mercies. We thank you for the promises. We thank you for this platform. We thank you for APC Bible College and every teacher who is zealous to teach us your word about Father and equip us for the ministry that you have called us for about Father. And as we are in your presence today, Father, we invite you to come and teach us through Pastor. We invite you to give us that wisdom and favor to understand the word in its depth. And Lord Father, be filled with your revelation to be equipped to do your ministry of our Father and to reach out to nation and to nations, Father, for your glory, honor, and praise, Lord. Bless each one who is here. Bless each one who would be hearing this word. Bless each one who is uh, seeking you, our Father, with all his heart, Father. Help us and guide us through the day. Let all things be under your control, Father, as we give you glory, honor, and praise and ask this prayer in the precious and matchless name, Father. We also want to uplift Brother Elisha, who's not been keeping well, Father, whose request is on the on the page, Father. We pray for your divine intervention in his health, Father, that the spirit of infirmity be broken, Father, and he be strengthened in your grace by the blood of Jesus. Root out every infection from his body, Father, and strengthen him in his mind, body, soul, and spirit to be, Lord, Father, uh, completely healed, and Father, be able to join back his work, join back uh, the college, Father. And Father, be a blessing to everyone who comes across. Father, bless him with good health, with, with your favor, and with all of those who are uh, suffering, Father, in this time when many of them are suffering through virals or, uh, Lord, Father, being attacked, for, Father, by any kind of sickness and infirmity. We pray for your divine intervention and for your healing virtue to flow through each of them, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise once again for bringing us all together to worship you, Father. And to learn from your word in Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that prayer. Okay, we will uh, begin our class for today. Uh, we seem to be almost at the end of the book of John. Uh, so today we would be covering chapters 18 and 19. Um, so we are almost reaching the end because um, you know these two chapters deal with Jesus being arrested and then being crucified. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of interesting details that we see in these two chapters. Uh, so um, uh, to get started, maybe we could uh, just have someone read out the very first verse. Uh, and then from there, we'll go along. So uh, John chapter 18, verse 1, if someone could read out first, please. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook to draw where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Yes. Uh, so it says very specifically in the book of John that Jesus went into a garden. Uh, in, in the other Gospels, we just see that there's Gethsemane, the, the town Gethsemane, which is mentioned. Uh, but then uh, here we are told that he goes into a garden in that particular city. Uh, so. Um, which is why scholars you know, tend to draw a link between this garden and the Garden of Eden. And they talk about how the first Adam, he fails in the uh, Garden of Eden. But over here, we have the second Adam who comes, and he's successful in uh, gaining victory over Satan. You know, Rather than uh, uh, look to his own self-interests, the Lord uh, says, let your will be done. And he's, he, you know, he submits to the Father. Uh, so the contrast is drawn between the event that took place in the first garden, the Garden of Eden, and the event that we see over here in the garden in this town of Gethsemane. And uh, uh, we see that the second Adam uh, was successfully able to gain the victory uh, for all of humanity through his act. Um, on the other hand, the first Adam, in fact, let down all of humanity by, you know, uh, dragging us into sin and uh, bringing death into the world and all of that. Uh, so um, Jesus is able to cancel what the first Adam did, and he is able to redeem and restore, uh, you know, mankind once again. We will now maybe look at uh, verses 2 to 6. 
uh, way we have the basic uh, outline given of the events that um, you know start off this whole arrest. Uh, so uh, if someone could read out verses two to six. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often went there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests, and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered, Him, Jesus and Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Yes. Uh, so we see that they are using torches and lanterns and uh, all of that. And it's very, very clear that this entire incident is taking place in the night. Um, so the Jewish leaders are very aware that what they are doing is crooked, that it's not uh, uh, you know, transparent and uh, honest and um, you know, uh, good. So they are doing it under the cover of night, like as if they are guilty people. And it shows that they are aware that what they are doing is wrong. Um, if they had tried to do something like this in the broad daylight, um, you know, with all the public present, then uh, the people who are watching, the onlookers, would have seen all the events taking place. Uh, so then they would make a judgment for themselves whether what is being done is correct or wrong. And uh, they probably would have reached a different conclusion. So the leaders don't want to take that risk. They don't want their crookedness exposed. And so they are doing it in the secret cover of the night. And um, they would not have been very aware of Jesus' movements, you know, where he's going to be at which point of time. So uh, Judas, um, you know, offer becomes very useful to them uh, because uh, Judas would be aware of where, you know, um, Jesus' itinerary, where he would be going next. So, uh, they probably would have told him, you know, at an ideal time when Jesus is kind of isolated away from the public, uh, let us know. So Judas, of course, now comes to them and tells them that Jesus is going to be going to a garden where, you know, um, uh, he would be alone with his disciples. So uh, with his help, they plan to, you know, use this particular night to make the arrest. And so we have Judas coming along over here, along with all the, uh, along with all the, um, you know, soldiers. And um, um, they are, it, it just says over there in verse 3, a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests. So um, it looks like uh, the soldiers also belong to the chief priests and the officials as well. Um, so this seems to be the temple guard uh, because, you know, all, all the way from the Old Testament uh, times, we had the Levites who had been appointed as uh, you know to be on guard duty uh, to guard the treasures of the temple and to uh, guard the temple premises. So these soldiers are probably those you know um, uh, Levites who are attached to the uh, temple guard. So all of them come over here now uh, to arrest Jesus and um, uh, Jesus you know rather probably very. Uh, uh, mockingly he says you know whom are you seeking because he knows very well why they have come and uh, uh, they say that they are looking for jesus of nazareth and uh, he very clearly uses the uh, divine uh, you know term he just says i am uh, so they are, so uh, when they say when he says that when he says i am uh, it says over here in verse 6 they drew back and fell to the ground uh, so uh, the power of his name the power of who he is uh, is um, comes through in those two words which he utters um, when he says, I am. And um, um, if these events had taken place during the daytime, the crowd, in fact, would have seen that happening. So, you know, or they don't get to see all of that because it's taking place in secret. Uh, but the power of Jesus is very uh, apparent over here. Um, and then if we could uh, read out verses 7 to 11, please. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So he, if you seek me, let these men go. 
This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew, a, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Uh, so we have a very lovely incident mentioned here, and it shows the heart of Peter, uh, who he really is, uh, what he really feels you know towards his master uh, so uh, jesus speaks up in verse 8 and he says if you are looking for me then let these men go uh, he doesn't want the um, disciples to come to harm uh, he doesn't want them getting involved in the you know uh, in, in, in the violence which may take place and so to protect them he says that and which is why uh, you know john the writer he emphasizes that once again in verse 9 and he says these words jesus spoke these words uh, to fulfill uh, you know the statement which he made earlier i have not lost one of those you gave me so he doesn't want anyone to get hurt um, so he says you know you've come here to arrest me take me but let these others go you know don't harm them and immediately you see uh, peter's response Even as Jesus, you know, shows his love, his compassion, and his concern for his disciples, he needed to his rescue. He trusts the sword that he has with him, and uh, he's willing to start an attack. So he begins by cutting off the ear of uh, one of the servants. And then Jesus commands Peter and says, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So he is saying, don't do this. I am willing to be arrested. I'm willing to go through this. And that would have puzzled Peter a lot because Peter was willing to fight to the death. He was willing to do whatever it takes to you know, save his master. But the master is saying, it's OK. This is something I want to do. This is a cup which I want to drink from. And um, that would have made Peter feel helpless. And in fact, it would have puzzled all of the disciples uh, because they want to fight. They want to defend. They care about him. But the Lord himself is saying, you know, it's OK. I know this is something that I want to go through. He has been warning them about this. He has been kind of preparing their hearts for this, but they just never caught it. So when it actually is happening, they're so puzzled. They're wondering why, why is Jesus kind of giving up? Because you see, from their perspective, they, they, they would have thought he's not fighting back. He's giving up. Why is he giving, giving up, you know? so. Uh, but they are still very, very concerned. And so uh, when the soldiers begin to take him away, you have uh, two of the disciples who follow, you know, uh, a little behind uh, the crowd because they don't want to completely go back home and just sit over there. They're still very worried, very concerned. The love is still there. And uh, so we see in one of the later verses that Peter and uh, John, uh, they continue to follow. Uh, the soldiers, even as uh, you know, the soldiers are leading Jesus to the house of uh, um, of Annas, and Annas would be the father-in-law of the high priest. Uh, so they didn't go to the high priest's house; uh, they went to the house of the father-in-law of the high priest. So, which is why you know maybe Annas is the real power behind the throne. Uh, so maybe he's the one who kind of you know. Um, manipulates everything and controls everything so they take him over there to uh, his house um and um yeah in your in your textbook there are some things mentioned about annas uh, he was the high priest from 6 ad to 15 ad at which point of time the Romans, in fact, remove him from his position. So it's probably after that that Caiaphas is placed you know, in his um, uh, position as high priest. Uh, so he's somebody who is very powerful. And uh, we're not very sure why the Romans you know, remove him uh, and uh, appoint another person. So maybe he was very, very crooked. Maybe he had you know, involved in some kind of dealings that they were not pleased with. Uh, so uh, now we have the, um, you know, the preparations starting for the uh, Ill illegal trial that they want to do. And uh, so here it just talks about Peter and um, 
John who are following Jesus. And uh, we have verses 15 to 18, uh, where you have the servant girl asking, are you one of the disciples? And now Peter says, you know, he replies, I am not, uh, because it seems to be pointless uh, to be taking Jesus' side when Jesus seems, seems to have, you know, uh, given himself up. He seems to be willing to um, get arrested and imprisoned or whatever it is that's going to happen. And so Peter probably would have thought, you know, now where's the point? Uh, you know, uh, he was willing to actually die for him. He was willing to fight for him. But now um, Jesus is not doing anything. So he probably, you know, uses his logic and thinks, uh, you know, where's the point now in associating myself with the Lord, because uh, the Lord seems to be saying, I want to go through this. So he says, no, 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 you know, I'm not associated with him because he, he too would get arrested uh, and he doesn't want to get arrested. Uh, so uh, we see um, we see that what Peter is doing over here can be, um, you know, logically explained to an extent. Uh, and uh, we see that there are two things, this logic and this loyalty. Sometimes when you are trying to be loyal to someone, you know, you don't really care how logical or illogical it is. Uh, what matters to you is being completely loyal to that person. And uh, here you see Peter uh, reasoning in his heart and probably thinking, you know, where's the point? Now, if I associate my name with Jesus, who doesn't even wish to defend himself, where's the point? So he's being logical about it. And um, so in a, uh, he's in, a, in fact not being quite loyal. Um, it's a fine line uh, between these two things, you know, when someone in, in a situation like this. Uh, but there are many Christians down the ages who were persecuted, who kind of had to make a choice whether they would be logical about their faith or whether they would be completely loyal uh, to the Lord. Um, I mean, I'm just reminded of uh, the, you know, um, communist era when a lot of uh, Christians were being persecuted and then uh, they would place a you know Bible on the floor and they would say you know spit on it and uh, there would be people who would you know think logically and say you know I, I mean if I spit on it it doesn't make a difference because in, in my heart I still love the Lord and I still will be worshiping him and they would go ahead and logically they would you know spit uh, but then the, there would be others who would say, it doesn't matter. Even if I get killed, it's all right. But I refuse to, you know, it's just symbolic. I mean, they're just symbolically doing it. But still, they want to go all the way and declare their full loyalty. And so they would. there were many people who said, no, I, I will not spit on the Bible. And I'd rather get killed. So you can be logical or you can just allow logic to go out of the window and say, I don't care whether it makes sense or not, but I am going to express my full love and loyalty to my Lord. Uh, so in this case, Peter actually fails uh, badly on that front. He's being very safe. He's being very careful uh, and logical, uh, but that is not actually the loyalty, you know. So we see that he denies him. And um, uh, we see one more, I mean, later on in the, you know, it, it talks about how he denies him once again. Um, and um, moving back to the other events which are taking place over here, uh, verses 19 to, oh, okay, we, we have a person who has raised their hand. Yeah, uh, please go ahead, brother. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I want to know that, uh, as you said, uh, um, Peter was actually loyal, was not able to be loyal. But uh, I just want to know, uh, as you said, as you gave that example. So if the Peter was loyal to the, to, to, uh, if he showed the loyalty in that way at that time, might be he could have killed. And uh, the prophecy, what Jesus said, which is Jesus spoke about him, uh, how it could be fulfilled. And second thing, uh, I just want to know that. Um, is what it is like uh, that point of time he became logical was wrong or uh, or that that protected him so that uh, through him he could able to because later he proved his loyalty uh, through his ministry and all so uh, to ease uh, like as you said that uh, the, the communist era like many people did not uh, you know spit uh, and um, uh, so how you how you see this thing like no because even though Jesus prophesied that you will you will deny me 
so that prophecy was also to be fulfilled and uh, jesus also had a plan that he should be the one who is going to carry the key of the uh, kingdom so how you will judge it thank you pastor that's my question yeah <laughs> now in um, peter's case it is very clear what jesus would have preferred he would have wanted loyalty he says peter you will deny me peter says lord i'm willing to die for you and uh, you know jesus says uh, you're saying that now but you know what you're actually going to deny me and the word used over there is deny uh, betray uh, you know say no no i'm in no way associated with this person so um, uh, in peter's case it was very very clear that jesus wanted a display of full loyalty and uh, peter did not give that uh, now when it comes to other believers down the ages i think that's just a choice which you know each person would have to personally make now if if i ever have to face that day i truly hope i mean uh, that i would throw logic out and you know just show my full display of love and loyalty um but i mean i don't know that's just a personal choice which each of us would have to make uh, for ourselves um uh, now coming to the other aspects uh, if god has a prophecy that want that needs to be fulfilled uh, he can uh, do anything in a situation to make that prophecy come through so um, it uh, say so jesus, jesus could have i mean god could have worked in ways uh, which would have prevented peter from being killed so nothing can stand in the way of god's prophecies so if there's a prophecy upon someone's life and they are living in accordance with uh, uh, god's leading that prophecy will come to pass god will arrange circumstances and make sure that it comes to pass and um, regarding the keys of the kingdom being given to peter um, if we look at that particular passage uh, there are portions of the passage where when jesus says to you giving to you and it's the singular word where uh, the words are being spoken directly to peter but then uh, in another, in the in the later portion of the same uh, passage when it says you know uh, you can bind and you can lose it's not referring to the singular you it's talking about plural you all of you so no it was not something that was given specially a position that was especially given only to peter no uh, that's a position which has been given to all of the church uh, so the church is not uh, built on peter at all um because again even that word used over there uh, you have two words petra and petros two completely different words i will not get into the all of the details of that uh, but it's very very important for us to know that the kingdom was not built on peter at all uh, um, yeah okay so um, i think peter was petros and the, the 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 foundation is petra petra is feminine uh, petros is uh, masculine and they are two completely different uh, you know um usages of the noun so that entire structure of that uh, passage uh, and the roman catholic church kind of got it wrong so they they regard peter as the first pope and all of that uh, but uh, the whole basis on which they lay that uh, is completely wrong because when you look at the basic um, uh, greek used over there jesus is in no way saying that it's going to be on peter that the whole church is going to be built not at all um yeah Uh, if someone else had raised their hand uh, if the person would like to speak otherwise we can move on yeah let's just uh, thank move you, on yes thank you um yeah so um we yes we come to verses 19 to 20 four again we have some very interesting things mentioned here uh, so if someone could read out all of those verses uh, verse 19 to 24 please the high priest then questioned jesus about his disciples and his teachings jesus answered him i have spoken openly to the world i have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together i have said nothing in secret When you ask me, ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers said, uh, standing by, struck Jesus with his hand, saying, "Is that how you answer the high priest?" Jesus answered him, "If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But what I said is right, bear 
Why do you strike me? Uh, I'm not swimming. Then send him down to high place, the high place. Okay, so um over here you have uh, Kayafer speaking and uh, he's trying to find some kind of defect in uh, Jesus doctrine and Jesus wordings so that you know he can uh, later on say uh, yeah yeah see because of these false doctrines that Jesus is holding that's the reason why we had to take this extreme step and have him executed so he's trying to catch Jesus in his speech and Jesus very openly says, look, this is not the first conversation that we are having, you know, out in the open, out in the public. I've always very, very clearly expressed my views. And there had been a lot of deb debates which went on between the Jewish leaders and Jesus with all the public listening. And in all those debates, it was the you know leaders who went away uh, defeated. They could never, ever uh, say, look, this man is, um, you know, breaking the law of Moses. He is denying what the Old Testament scriptures are saying. They, none of them could ever say that. So in all of the debates which took place in the open public, uh, Jesus very carefully proved what he was saying using Old Testament scriptures. And these people could never win any of the arguments. So Jesus is saying, now why are you again asking me this? Because whatever I had to say has already been very, very clearly spoken out in the open. Now, if you are now questioning me in secret, it's because you're planning on cooking up some new, you know, fake charges. So if this debate had happened in the out in the public, you know, in the daytime, again, Jesus would have very plainly spoken the things which he has spoken earlier. Again, these people would have stood defeated in the you know debate. So here they are doing it in secret in the night because they want to you know just go out in the morning to the crowd and say ah you know what when we were talking to him all these false uh, words came out and he's you know he's holding all these uh, wrong doctrines uh, and he wants to spread them so they are kind of trying to come up with the uh, fake things and uh, so in verse 23 you know jesus says if i said something wrong testify as to what is wrong you know but if i spoke the truth why did you strike me? So Jesus is very confident about his stand. And uh, even as he's saying all of these things, I'm sure all those leaders and all these people standing over there, they very clearly know that what they are doing is very, very crooked. And they don't have uh, you know, any proper standing uh, to be doing what they are doing. Um, so um, we see that. Uh, we see the transparency of Jesus coming across. We also see the crookedness of these people. And in your uh, textbook, it talks about how trials like this should have been conducted in the daytime, uh, you know, where the public clearly knows that there's a trial going on. Um, also, uh, uh, it would be something that would be done in the Sanhedrin. The entire Sanhedrin would get together. Uh, and then a decision would be taken. But here you just have a bunch of people. You have the high priest, you have his uh, um, thing, uh, father-in-law, you, and you have a few others. Uh, it's not the entire Sanhedrin which is meeting together and taking this decision. And moreover, one single person actually cannot pronounce judgment, which is what they are planning on doing over here. So they are doing the entire thing in a very, very crooked manner because they actually don't have any for, uh, charges to bring against Jesus and they would have to fabricate false charges. So it's easier to fabricate false charges when you're doing it secretly, which is why they're doing it in the night. So. Um, John uh, kind of leaves this part of the um, you know narrative here. He doesn't go into further detail. In the other Gospels, you have more details uh, given about uh, Jesus' conversations with these people. But John over here moves on to the interactions which take place with Pilate. So um, Pilate was someone who had never really cared about the Jews, uh, had no respect for their culture or their faith. And um, uh, in fact, he uh, had been so insensitive in the past to uh, to their religion and their faith that in fact the Jews had you know uh, given a complaint against him uh, to the Roman emperor. So um, uh, Pilate was someone who could not care less about any of the you know religious matters of the uh, Jews. And now Jesus is taken to Pilate. Uh, so they come over here to the Roman governor's palace in verse 28 um and um 
yeah, we have a lot of verses. Maybe we don't really need to read all of those. Uh, if we could maybe read out verses 28 and 29. Then they led Jesus from the house of Gaius to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. He then said they not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring up against this man? Yeah. Uh, so um, they, they started off first in Anna's house. From there, uh, they go to you know Caiaphas' house. And now they have come to the um, palace of the Roman governor. And um, they do not enter the palace of this Gentile. Because if they enter the Gentile's palace, then that will make them ceremonially unclean. And then they will not be able to eat the Passover. So they are very, very eager and very, very keen on eating the Passover. And uh, John mentions that over here because it's so ironic. They are getting all ready to you know, murder the Passover lamb. But they want to eat the Passover lamb. It's, uh, it, it just shows the, the sheer hypocrisy of the whole thing. Even as they are making uh, serious plans, to have the Passover lamb killed, they also want to act like as if they want to participate in him and you know be a part of him. And um, they don't realize uh, that what they are doing is so um, ridiculously ironical, you know. So they don't realize it. Um, so it says over here very specifically, they wanted to eat the Passover, and that is why they did not enter the palace, and they're standing very piously outside. And um, so Pilot comes outside and he uh, speaks to them. Um, and uh, oh yeah, there was something mentioned in your uh, um, notes which was interesting. If if you know if someone could read out verses thirty one and thirty two, please. Yeah. Pilate said to them, "Take him yourself and judge him by your own law." The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Yeah, so uh, when they say over here, we have no right to execute anyone, they're very specifically talking about execution through crucifixion. Um, you know, uh, I mean, at, at least that's the, you know, that's the meaning which comes out when we read the rest of the passage, uh, or the overall context. So over here, they're speaking specifically about how they do not have any uh, rights given by the Roman government to crucify anyone. And uh, that is why they need Pilate's uh, permission to be able to uh, you know, give Jesus this kind of a uh, death sentence. Why didn't they choose stoning? Why did they not choose beheading? You know, they could have chosen those methods as well. Uh, but uh, I think they probably chose crucifixion because when it comes to, to the scriptures, when it comes to the Old Testament scriptures, crucifixion is considered um, something, uh, something like a curse. And also when it comes to the Roman point of view, crucifixion is something that's reserved for only the worst people. So in case they had chosen you know, stoning or if they had chosen beheading, uh, the public would question and say, are they doing this to an innocent man? Is there injustice happening over here? Uh, there would be talk. There would be conversations. Um, and uh, they don't want that. So they decide that, you know, these leaders decide that crucifixion would be the best method to adopt because that is something that, uh, you know, they go through very serious uh, procedures before they come to that particular kind of a uh, capital sentence. Um, because it says in Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, I mean, no, we are, we are familiar with that. But if someone could read out Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23, uh, and what it says about um, crucifixion. Deuteronomy 21. Yeah. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, 
His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for inheritance. Amen. So it's not just bad that uh, the a person has been, you know, uh, killed and then just hung on a tree. Um, it also implies that this man is under a curse. So he's somebody very, very evil. Someone who has done something very terrible. Only such people are, you know, literally under a curse of God. So they want to demonstrate that they are really these good, pious leaders who have done this to this man because there is actually a curse upon him. What he has done is so terrible. This this false doctrine that he is spreading is so terrible that there is a curse upon his life. So they are not satisfied with just opting for stoning or opting for beheading, they want to go all the way and have this particular form of uh, punishment imposed because, uh, of course, crucifixion was not there in the you know, book of Deuteronomy times. Uh, but the whole idea of somebody being hung from a tree so that it would indicate that there's a curse upon this person. This person has done something very, very terrible. And also it would kind of make them give them a kind of legal uh, you know, uh, backing because the Romans were not very you know, casual about crucifixion. They killed many people. But when it came to crucifixion, that was something that was reserved for only the worst people, the worst offenders. So um, you would never have any of the Roman authorities very casually crucifying someone. You would need to have proper reasons for it. And uh, so they, these leaders would have conspired and thought, this is the best method to employ. Uh, so that the whole public will think that you know we are really justified and we are really right in doing what we are doing. Uh, so they ask Pilate and say, you know, you got to you know cooperate with us and help us in this because we don't have the right to do the crucifixion. But if you say yes, then it can be done. Okay, so this is kind of a, a bit of a background regarding why they choose this particular mode. But of course, uh, they were also fulfilling the scriptures, which they don't realize at that time. Um, so now the conversation between Pilate and uh, Jesus begins. And uh, uh, if we could read out verses 33 to 35. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of Jews? Uh, Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Okay, so Pilate, uh, like I said earlier, really wasn't interested at all in the religion of the Jews or their faith and their beliefs. Uh, he's just basically looking at this whole thing from a um, political point of view. You know, uh, if this if this if there's a person out here who's claiming to be a king and there's going to be a rebellion tomorrow then he needs to take charge so he's basically asking you know jesus you know are you a king uh, because if you're calling yourself a king then maybe i need to take action against you because you know the emperor the roman emperor doesn't want anyone going around saying that they are kings and trying to make themselves independent of the roman authority so are you the king of the because you know pilate would have been aware of the grand entrance of jesus uh, into jerusalem where all the people were crying out and saying you know hosanna and uh, to the son of david and all of that so he asks are you the king of the Jews? And uh, then Jesus very plainly says in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. You know, I am a king, but my kingdom is not from here, which is why I even told my servants not to put up a fight, you know, not to defend me. So um, he gives Pilate the assurance that he is not trying to create any kind of rebellion against the Roman emperor. His kingdom is a different kind, uh, so something else altogether. So he says that to Pilate, and uh, um, once you know Pilate hears this, uh, he kind of loses interest in the sense um, he's only worried about some kind of political in insurrection or some kind of rebellion. Uh, so um, once Jesus says that he is not of this world, his kingdom is not of this world, then it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, and uh, we see his response in verses 37 and 38, if someone could read out that. Then 
Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So um, here, uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, verse 38. Please go ahead, yeah. Pilate said to him, What is true? Yeah. After so, he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Okay, so uh, this is the first time that Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. He will go on to say this another two times, three times, very openly. You have Pilate, uh, the Roman governor, very clearly declaring in public that I find no fault in this man. Okay, so. Um, the basic conversation here. So Pilate says, oh, OK, you're saying that you're not from uh, from here, uh, but you are a king, is it? And Jesus says, you know, I have come to declare the truth. And if you believe in this, and all those who believe in the truth, uh, they are on, on the, if they, those who believe in me, they are on the side of the truth. So here, Jesus is giving an offer to Pilate. Are you willing to believe in this truth? Are you willing to accept it and stand on it? So. In the middle of all of this, uh, there's a salvation offer actually being extended to this man, you know, the, to this very powerful man. Uh, and Jesus says, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So are you willing to listen to me? Uh, are you willing to accept me, you know, as a king who has come over here? And uh, Pilate's response is, what is truth? You know, so um, this is a very popular view that we have today. And um, Pilate obviously held the same view. Everyone's opinion, you know, uh, seems to be, you know, nowadays, you hold on to what you believe in. I hold on to my version of the truth. You know, you have your version of the truth. I have my version of the truth. Because all our versions of truth are just you no know, different philosophies. You have a philosophy, I have a philosophy. So let's all hold on to our philosophies and then let's peacefully coexist. Why are you saying that your philosophy is better than mine? Why are you saying that your philosophy is more truthful than mine? Because there is no one constant truth. It's the general belief, you know, that's kind of prevailing. There is no one solid, um, solitary truth. There are just multiple truths in the sense that there are multiple philosophies is what people say. So over here, you know, Pilate is saying, huh, what is truth? You know, truth, there are different versions of it. Uh, but Jesus says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He says, I have come to testify to the truth. So there is one solid truth. There are many philosophies. Some philosophies line up with the truth and many philosophies do not line up with this the truth but there is one singular truth which we cannot escape from and the world does not accept that they are like oh what is truth your truth is your truth my truth is my truth but no her truth is not something uh, uh, you know which you um, you know come up with on your own there is one single established truth which the creator god has set up and uh, either you believe in that or you don't there are no multiple truths, uh, you know, so that is something which many people refuse to accept. And um, yeah, we will, um, we could maybe, no, I think we'll not have time to get into the next uh, portion. So maybe we could, you know, go for a break. Um, so at 10 o'clock, we'll uh, log back in. And we'll continue with this passage. All right, thank you. <laughs> 